the first time, thank you for doing so. Uh, if you're watching this as a playback, thank you for doing so. This is uh, a segment called Say It Like It Is, um, where we talk about eclectic topics. Uh, people send me their stories to foodchannel1960 at gmail.com. You can look in the description below for my email address. So let's see who is online. If you can hear me, you can see me, hit the like button. What's going on, what's going on, what's going on? Welcome to Say It Like It Is. What's going on, people? Good evening, good evening, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Hit the like button so we can gain more traction, all right? Uh, if this is your first time, if you like what I'm about, I hope you would like my video. And please give consideration to um, hitting the, the, um, the subscribe button, hit the bell button, all right? So that you are alerted when I'm online like this, you know, or with any pre-recorded content. What's going on, people? Hi, Bukola. What's going on, people? Manyi, Imani, Drama Free Chica, Hazan. What's up, Franklin? I'm all right, thanks. I hope you're good. I hope you're well. Hit the like button, hit the like button. So, before we crack on, this um, segment is sponsored by Adron Homes and Properties, with, who I have um, a partnership with, okay? They are based in Nigeria. It's a fantastic real estate company. And um, forever, I've been saying it on here, for those that have been watching me for a minute, rather than pile your money in the banks and all that stuff, you know, put your money in... Uh, real estate, all right? So basically with Adron Homes, if you've got money, you can buy your lands outrightly or you can put down a reasonably sized deposit and pay for your lands on a monthly basis, six months period, um, 12 months, or even across two years. You know, it gives you that room of affordability without choking you up and stuff like that. And it's amazing. So where do I come in? I'm a business development executive. I have a partnership with them. I guide you through the process, ensure your paperwork are done in the back end. You don't pay to me directly. Payments go into Adron Homes um, business accounts and um, it gets reconciled by the relevant individuals or departments. And then you get, you know, the necessary documentations when you finish paying for your land. It's as simple as blinking your eyes. So uh, to cut the long story short, if you're interested in owning uh, properties worth um, Adron Homes and Properties in Nigeria, just look in the description below. Send an email to foodchannel1960 at gmail.com. Foodchannel1960 at gmail.com. Just say, Franklin, please send me the application pack for Adron Homes. That's all you got to say. And let me say this. I don't like time wasters, all right? I And I say that respectfully. Some people would come and dance around and ask you totally relevant questions. They waste your time back and forth. 12 emails back and forth and they disappear into the thin air, all right? Uh, whilst you're not mandated or obligated to buy or invest in something, you know, I like the fact that people that are interested and they really want to jump on the train, they know what they're doing, they've got money to invest in something. I will answer all of your questions. If you need to find out more, I'll point you into the relevant departments. So that's what I'm saying. I hope you understand. So send me an email to foodchannel1960 at gmail.com and I'll send you the application pack and we can take it from there, all right? So there we go, boom. Now, today's story. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are once again. So a few days ago, for those that have been watching me for a minute, I had a live stream you know, session. I talked about... Uh, my uh, three months, after three months in Nigeria, my observation and all that stuff, that video did very well, resonated with a lot of people. Um, the comments were quite great. Uh, my inbox were bombarded with all sorts of, you know, messages and all that. And um, I think um, in one of the bullet points, I said, stop playing God, all right? So it was a few days ago. This was what happened. I was going into a local shop. And um, there was this elderly, I actually went into a local shop to buy something. So there was this elderly gentleman with a walking stick um, that was on his way out. 
So I realized that he kind of looked over his shoulder. He had a smile on his face. So I thought he was just looking and just, you know, I don't know, because I didn't know him from nowhere. So as I stepped out on the pavement, and he was just like, uh, you know, his hands were quite shaky, you know. Um, he's got a walking stick, a bit bent. And he goes, are you, are you Franklin? So I looked at him and I said, yes, sir. So then he said in Yoruba language, I said, Bawuni. I said, Dadani sa, Era sa. But I didn't recognize him. So I kind of paused and I said, I was going to say, I don't know the face. And I said, I, I watch your channel on YouTube. So I was, wow. So I laughed. I was surprised. Like, you know, I looked at him, not in a bad way, but I was surprised that the gentleman of, of that age would have maybe time to listen to me on my channel. So it was a bit of a proud moment for me. And he was like, ah. Oh. He said, uh, so he made reference to my live stream just a few days ago. And he goes, Franklin, that your live stream about, you know, after spending three months in Nigeria, your observations and all that. He said, I watched it. So I was like, ah, oh, all right, sir. So we got talking. Now, this man's conversation with me led to the live stream tonight. And I hope at least one person will learn something from it. It kind of um, emphasized some of the things I've said repeatedly in the past. But these one is a story that's unique to the elderly gentleman. So hence the title, all right? Uh, if you can hear me, you can see me. Can I ask you nicely to please give the video a thumb up or the live stream, sorry. So anyways, um, I was concerned because I realized he struggled a bit with his balance. He had a walking stick. And I was concerned about keep, keeping him for too long on his feet. And then, but fortunately, adjacent to where we were standing, there was like a couple of bike racks. So there was a vacant bike rack. And I, he was like, he was preemptive. He was like, don't worry. I'll, um, let's move forward a bit. I would lean my bum on the bike rack so I can sort of rest a bit and talk to you. So I, okay, sir. So, you know, respectfully, I had my nylon bag with what I've just paid for. And we had a bit of a chit chat. Uh, good evening, Sam. What's up, bro? And um, we cracked on. And then the man said, you know, thank you for what you do for the community. He said, you know, um, I it was one of my friends that introduced your video to me. So the first time I watched one of your videos, I said, oh, I like this young man. I like his thought process. So like I said, it was a bit of a proud moment for me. I was beaming with smile. I'm not going to deny that. You know, it's nice when you get complimented. So anyway, so we cracked on chatting. And then he was like, Franklin, you know, um, some of your videos, I noticed that his countenance changed and um, he was smiling. He was rocking back and forth. And then some, suddenly he kind of just leaned up on the bike rack and he looked at me dead in the eyes and I could see that the countenance changed. So he said, you know, some of your videos, it's like opening a wound and it reminds me of my, the years and all the losses, my sufferings and um, what has happened to me. He said, I'm old now, I've got really brittle bones and all that. And sometimes it moves me to tears. So I was kind of taken aback. I, I didn't know what to say. Hey, what's up, man? Idris, my man. I see you, brother. So we carried on talking. And um, the, the gentleman was fixated on my eyeballs. Like he was looking at me and we carried on talking. And he said, you know, the bit that really attracted me, I mean, that really touched me during your live stream about you spending three months in Nigeria and your observations and stuff was when you were emphasizing on people should stop playing God and all that. So I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And it goes, well, yeah. And he said, opening a wound. Thank you, Kathy. And then it was like, um, I remember when my bones used to be strong and all that. So he told me a story and this is the story. It goes, Franklin, you know, for 23 years of my life, I played God. 
and he said, I foolishly played God. It goes, I don't mind you. I know you're a good storyteller. I don't mind you telling my story on your channel. Uh, hopefully, at least you young people that still got strong bones can learn one or two things. And it kind of moved me to tears in the end when I listened to him. It was a very short 30 to 35 minutes of conversation. but was very powerful, very emotional. Now, this is a story. So the gentleman said, Franklin, um, when I was, you know, when I was still stronger and, and all that, uh, I said, for 23 years, I played God. You know, he's been in England for many years. And he said, I used to, you know, uh, when I was younger, I made money in this country. I did all sorts. He goes, but I lacked financial knowledge. And he goes, I can blame that predominantly on the sort of background. He said he came from a polygamous family. Dad was a sort of like an authoritarian, kind of dictator type of person. He had multiple wives. He, he didn't have any really private moments with him. He's, he watched his mother got brutalized um, as a youngin. She had five children. Two died due to not being able to pay for, cater for hospital bills back in Nigeria then and stuff. So himself and the other two managed through hook or crook means they made their way to England. That was many years ago, right? So at the time of talking to this gentleman, he told me that his age is 69. He's 69 this year, so he'll be 70 next year. Now, so as we cracked on, he said, Franklin, all those years, you know, like, um, because his father's side, you know, father married multiple wives. He had several siblings that emanated from the other wives and also from his uh, mother's side and all that. So a bulk of his years, when he had strong bones here in England, and he did say in a funny manner, he goes, well, ap apart from that, spending money on family, goes, well, you know, I recognize the error of my ways now. I was a bit of a ladies man as well. That also had a devastating effect on my finance. He said, but predominantly 23 years of my life, I used to remit money because there were people that I know that I built houses for whilst I lived in a box flat here in England. I, you know, I was making money. I had no financial sense. You think everything lasts forever. I didn't have a sense of investing or thinking of my own future or even the future of my own children. And the guy said, the man said, sorry, he did all sorts. There were countless people that he paid for their university education, polytechnic, set up businesses, all sorts of lies. This one wanted to go into transportation. There was somebody at some point that he bought two light ace vans for when light ace vans for those of you nigerians that know light ace buses those buses back then they used to call light ace so he said he, there was somebody that he bought two for um there was somebody he built a poultry for I, I suppose people get a buzz from that behavioral pattern he said you know i had a partnership with an indian friend at some point that we were running a sort of who introduced me to like sort of an uh, Connor shop at the time Connor shop was a big deal it wasn't as much as it is now because we we're running two of them I had one on Dalston Road uh, is it not not Kingsland Road or something Dalston Market areas I think in London and then <clears throat> he had another one some in another part of London or West London he said so he was seeing money then as the years went by uh, due to maybe racism or discrimination, the Indian friend, his family members, they never liked the fact that he became a close friend with a black man. So they kind of poisoned the mind of the Indian man. So that friendship sort of hit the rocks. And because he said he had lesser per percentages of the two, you know, shops, they bought him out. You know, it was the family connived, his brothers in the background, they kind of kicked him out. They wanted him out. But whilst that relationship, you know, lasted, he, he admitted to me that he made a ton of money. But again, lack of financial sense, lack of... Um, and that thing is a, is, a, is a major, major killer that affects um, a lot of us 
in the black community, if the truth be told. Because one of the worst things that can happen to you, it's not enough that, oh, I have one job, I have two, three jobs, I work as a project manager, I work as a nurse, I did this, I do that. But if you don't have financial sense, I was telling someone, I digress, I was telling someone the other day, it doesn't even, <clears throat> it doesn't, it doesn't even matter. Even if you are lucky enough to be um, a beneficiary of some kind of inheritance from your parents. This is inheritance. If inheritance meets zero monetary knowledge, the inheritance will go down the drain before you know it. It's a, it's a default setting. It's a universal problem. It's not, it's not unique to uh, being a Nigerian or, or nothing. So, you know, even me talking, as you grow through life, as you learn, Financial intelligence, thank you, plays a major role. And if you don't have it, I'm sorry, you just don't have it. If you don't have it, if you have no clue about monetary discipline, where to put your money, how to get your bread, bread by bread I mean money, how to get your money to work for you, you're done. You keep making blunders, you keep making stupid decisions, you will fall into the hands of charlatans, people that will take advantage of you, and, you know, the list goes on. Anyway... Back to this gentleman. He had no financial knowledge. So the business with the Indian man, you know, the f Indian man's family, it was a very good friend of his. You know, they, they, they broke that friendship. They didn't like the fact that a black man was part of their family, you know, making money. They didn't like the partnership. So they were able to buy him out because he had lesser, you know, percentages in both business, as he explained to me, because it was a lot of pressure and it's like he was up against the man's, his friend's entire family. He said they were very aggressive. They were threatening. He had death threats. So he backed out. He took the lump sum from the businesses. And he said he was a bit of a ladies' man. You know, Olusho Yakba. So I can imagine. Alain Nawolo, you know, Bush Ufomo, all sorts. Understandably so. And all of those things caught up with him as the years went, went by. No savings. Uh, you know, nothing. He was just tearing through abundance of sugar walls. And it was a different world back, back then, you know, I can imagine. Before you open your mouth, you can imagine he's, um, he's he told me that he had these fun, fascinating type of moustache at, at the time I was laughing, you know, looking like a porno star from the 70s and with his abs and all that, with a big lapel. I can imagine the ladies buckling their knees and shit, you know. But that was that. He lived that life he was throwing money at the people back home. And within the two shakes of a duck's tail, 20-something years went past. Now, here is what happened. So he was already having his financial issues. So a few years ago, a few years back, he went to Nigeria in a particular December, right? Just to spend Christmas, blah, blah, blah. So he, he didn't go home for a long time. So... When he went home, he said, Franklin, I got the shock of my life. And I asked him, what was that? He said, all the people that I had on my payroll that I thought I was catering for, I thought I was the guy at the top of the pyramid, giving them their daily bread and opening businesses for them, taking care of their children, school fees, sending them boxes of clothing, shoes, and bags. He said, I got the shock of my life when I realized that a lot of them, some of them had built homes, they had thriving businesses. He said, some of them wouldn't even bother to come and say hello to me. They said they were too busy. And he said, back then, you know, this he met, it was met with um, such level of hostility from some members of the family. So he was furious. Now, here was a turning point for the gentleman. During the course of that stay, he said he was in Oshogbo, in Oshun State somewhere, and to spend time with some friends and stuff. So they were on the express from Oshogbo traveling somewhere, forgotten where he said. There was a ghastly accident. The friend that was driving uh, the Mercedes-Benz kind of lost his focus on the express. I don't know. He said he was sat at the back. Another friend sat in front next to the driver. And 
there was a ghastly accident. They ended up under a truck, lost balance, ended up in the ditch. The friend that was driving died instantly. The other one in front lost his limb, didn't die, is wheelchair bound as we speak. So the accident, you know, he that plunged him from the back, the impact, he went through the windscreen. So the long and short was it was a ghastly accident, had an impact on his spine, uh, hip bone, broke his shoulder. He went through the screen because this man has like a bit of a mark on his forehead. And that was the accident that changed his life forever. Now, where am I going with this? So he said the accident was so devastating. He was bedridden in Nigeria and uh, he was from one hospital to the other. And he was in Nigeria for nearly five months. And he said the hospitals, um, some of the hospitals were just gulping, gulping his money. A friend helped him to get some money. So he got to a, a point where money ran thin and um, he was afraid that he was going to die. Now, he said to me at the time, he had a wife in the UK and all that. So the wife kind of sent a bit of money and, you know, they, 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 they tried their bit. So now, here is the point. He said, all the while, five to roughly six months, he was bedridden. It goes, Franklin, it was only four of those people that came. And out of the four, they only came maybe two or three times to check. There was a time he was in coma. He nearly died. It's so only four of them just came for like 20, 30 minutes, one hour by the bedside, even when he was unconscious. It was only four of them because the hospital took notes. He said he was bedridden. It was a childhood friend that was in Nigeria. The man was a farmer. He's late now that stood by him. The friend's wife were the ones that would come help, you know, bring food to him and all that. He nearly died. The family members didn't come. No, but even his siblings, they didn't come. One, he said the last born showed up once. Nobody came. Smash the like button, people. Thank you, boy. He said nobody. Nobody came. Now, the gentleman said he had maybe through the influence of that is friend, whilst he was bad with finance, that friend had sort of convinced him at some point, I remember now, to maybe start building a house, which was a four, we call it four bedroom, four flats, whereby you have two flats on the ground floor and then two at the top, yeah? The friend had convinced him like, but you're not with you, it's a good friend, you know? Like build that and maybe rent it out, you can have rent, you know, revenue from, the yearly um, rent from the tenants. So he had started the project and all that. So he said the documents, the land document or something was with one of his siblings and at the time. I don't know. Now, he was bedridden. So there was a time when he was unconscious. He was uh, in coma for a bit. Now, this is what the man told me. He said, Franklin... When I became conscious, my friend tried with his wife, you know, they were communicating with the British embassy to try to get him back to England because they were concerned that he might die. And they didn't want him to die in Nigeria so that he could get better treatment. So they managed, he said, they managed to contact the embassy. There was a lawyer that uh, the, the friend paid at the time. So the long and short, they managed to pack him up. They put him on the plane brought him to the UK so he could get treated. He said, Franklin, I ended up in Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital. Those of you in London would know Guy's and St. Thomas. He said, I was in Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital for nearly seven months going through recovery. Because he then, they had to, he said they had to cut his head open, that maybe brain hemorrhage or something like that. I had a couple of operations. I could see the line on his head. So... That absolutely smashed him. So he spent for the seven to eight months being bedridden here in the UK, 
the universe was just behind him. He didn't die. But it was life transforming because you can see from his posture that he's like this. He's bent. It emanated from the accident because what they said here in the UK was the doctors that had worked on him didn't handle the impact of the accident. Maybe, I, I don't know, I'm not a medical practitioner, so they didn't handle the impact on the spine properly. So he had inflicted him with some sort of deformity in that regard and hip bone was damaged. So basically, he didn't go back to normal. Now, oh, I was born in Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital, Nigerian. Nice to know. <laughs> so now, the man said, you know, it didn't, it absolutely transformed his life neg negatively, of course. So by the time he went through recovery, started doing physiotherapy because legs, everything were messed up. He went through physio. It took him nearly four years to start to regain himself because he told me, man, the wife was the one cleaning after him. It put a lot of pressure, a lot of strain on them, their relationship. By the time he regained himself. He said, Franklin, I discovered that the families that I had spent so much money catering for, playing God for, for 23 years, you can imagine, let that marinate for a moment. If you've been churning money at people for so long and you've done so much for them, it is incomprehensible that people can be so cold hearted that they can't even come through for you there is not an ounce of human feelings for people to just throw abundance of kindness at you when you need them the most. But hey, welcome to planet Earth. So this man said, by the time I gained my consciousness, later on I discovered the house in Nigeria had been sold, documents had been falsified, some people were making death threats that if he came back, they would make sure he died finally. Some of the monies that he committed into the hand of a sibling, uh, stolen, all sorts. Now, what dealt him the absolute blow? I mean, I respect this man, and I'm not attaching this particular beat that I'm, t I'm trying to talk about to the rest of the story. I respect him that you know, he's able to acknowledge his faults. Everybody makes mistakes. Sometimes when you look back in life, you recognize the errors of your ways. So he said, it got to a point due to frustration and the pressure, his wife, you know, I think emotionally hit a, a breaking point and she basically wanted out of the relationship. Now, he said, if I don't give you the background to it, you might instantaneously get judgmental that, oh, wow, how could she do that? Why would she abandon you? Why would she just leave you and run away? So remember I said at the start, he said it was a bit of a ladies' man. So whilst he was on the sick bed, um, there was a case of a Jamaican woman that showed up from nowhere who had twins, twin baby for this man. It was hidden. And there was another lady uh, that came from Dublin to London that she had an eight-year-old daughter. So the Jamaican lady's uh, siblings beat up his wife. They were quite aggressive about the whole thing because they were looking for him. They, they were under the impression that he had abandoned their sister who had twins, two lovely girls by him. So he was in the sickbed. So they, found, they managed to trace his home address and they knock, knock, knock. Wife opens the door. Where is Mr. Such and Such? Sorry, who are you? You can imagine the conversation. What? I beg your pardon? My husband? Blah, 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 blah. They must have exchanged words. They beat up the wife. They beat her to pulp. Um, for some reason, he said she didn't report it to the police. I don't know how that transpired. So you can imagine. But the woman still waited for him to kind of regain consciousness after all that he went through. So when he started to regain his balance, she sat him down and said she was done. She was moving on. She was broken, you know, emotionally. And look, the man, according to him, 
he said, look, Franklin, that bit is my doing. So he said, well, one of the most painful things that happened to me was I lost my wife. I said, but that's that. She's late now, the said wife. She's, she's dead now. He's 69, nearly 70. She developed cancer later, died. Now, these men, so since then became, oh, you definitely can't blame the woman. He said it himself, you know, and I respect him. I had a ton of respect for him. He told me himself because, no, you know, I put my hand up and I respect that. That's called being a man, at least being a human being, recognizing the error of your ways and accepting your own blame. So we can't, beat, you know, beat him up for that. That's that. So anyway, <clears throat> the man said, when the wife left, you know, children follow their mom, you know, he couldn't really cope because of health now, couldn't work anymore. He was dependent on carers, can't really gain, get back into any gainful employment, money's done, broke. Um, eventually was moved into a bed sit by the local authorities and um, he's been in that bed sit till date. He's 69. In the final lap of his 60s is almost 70. And I wouldn't lie to you because I'm a human being with um, with human feelings. I, I, I got teary-eyed at some point just listening to the gentleman. But he, he said, oh, Franklin, don't, 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 because he was looking at me and he said, don't, 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 don't worry about me. Don't, you know, I've, I've lived. And hmm, he said, I, I, I've lived. He said, but um, don't worry about that part. You know, everyone's got their shortcomings. He goes, but one of the regrets that I really have is the fact that when I was younger, when I had the bones, when I could put a bit away, he said, I had no financial knowledge. He said, I'm not going to lie to you. He said, but um, all of the people that I helped, families he goes nobody they don't even know if i'm dead because i'm as good as dead and he goes they don't care he said the only person that he sort of um chat to once in a while via whatsapp is one distant cousin and and he said and that's because she's here in the uk and she lives somewhere in manchester she's also you know she's uh maybe 62 He's about seven years older than her. So that's the only person. And then that woman's children, they check on him once in a while. So those are the only, you know, he, he tends not to have a relationship with his, he has a bit of a difficult relationship with his own children. But he said, um, lately, things are sort of getting back to normal. They're starting to check on him now. But the emphasis is on Franklin. I wasted the best part of my youth playing God. So when you look at these on paper, because some people would send me random emails, uh, where are his children? He did say they are here in England. They are just sort of mending. So the, I get the gist, come on, man. He was a bit of a ladies man. You should be able to read between the lines. He hurt their mom doing all that. So it's the, 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 the pattern of things would be, you know, the children will they, you know, they will resent him. It's understandable. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I get it. You, you, don't, you don't need me to tell you all that. Just fill in the blanks, man. So, but, but, but he said, his last born is a daughter. You know, women are always men. You know, we men would, not, especially men, when you do their mother's dirty, men will take sides with mom like that. Daughters tend to have a bit of a soft spot. So the daughter was able to pull in her brothers, you know, so she said, he said to me, he said, lately, they just showed up unannounced. They just came. A couple of them have children now. They came to check on him. He said they spent roughly two hours. He said it was quite tense because it was, they were eerily quiet at first, especially for the males. They kept going outside, making calls. And, you know, in the end, they sat, it was quite, understandable though they got there in the end it'd be of a chit chat they said they will come back he said but the daughter has been back three times already so there's a bit of a lifeline there at least uh, he wouldn't die a lonely man so that's something to hold on to but that's that so he talked about how 
he gave some of the monies that he gave away, investment, you know, that they absolutely forgot about. And a lot of them have gone, they've gone on to do well. Their own children, who knew that he used to be, there were people that he paid school fees for. Now, am I sat here telling you that one shouldn't be nice or be kind to people? Or am, am I telling you not to help people? Definitely not, right? It's nice to be, to be nice. But I think one of the devastating things you can do to yourself is, which is my message, playing God, catching this stupid buzz from playing God, God and throwing your, your, um, your forex blindly at people that really don't give a shit about you. They don't give a shit about you and forgetting yourself in the process. That's exactly my message. And there is one final note that the gentleman left me with, and we agreed on that. And he said, you know why such behavior is very quite prevalent in the black community? I said, go on, sir. And he said, it's a mental conditioning that is deeply rooted and it's this emotional blackmail. They teach you from when you're a child. You grow up with it. So I always say that you cannot give what you don't have. You pass on the same things. You instill it. You try your best also when you become an adult to force it down the lungs of your children. So when your children, if you have a child or a couple of them that see the light now, that think outside the box like me, Parents like that will then see those children as rebels, as not nice, as evil. But they're not exactly evil. Do you understand? It's, it's a very toxic culture that needs to be stopped desperately, that people need to tear themselves away from. There are people, you might be the only person that managed to travel in your family. It might be you and another sibling and that. I, I've said it before and I will say it again. The moment you get that visa from back home, the moment you step a foot on that plane, most people's families, they see you as a money-making machine, as a forex-generating machine, as an ATM machine. Some of them actually see you as the way out. They see you as the way out. Do you understand? They see you as the way out of, you know, or as a stepping stone to the top. Do you understand? So helping and being helpful with the balance. One of the worst things, there are people that live in the diaspora. If you ask them to open their wardrobes as we speak, some of them don't have four pairs of shoes. Some of them... Most of their clothings are just work. The, most of them will be seen as, most of the things that they have are just work clothings. Some of them don't have even good clothings that they can wear to special occasions like weddings or parties and stuff. The reason is, as the money comes in, you're paying bills. You're shelling the rest back home. You're trapped in that emotional blackmail. It's like if you don't do it, Mount Everest is going to come down on you. It's a mental conditioning and you spend years. You spend years being trapped in that cycle. I'll sit with a gentleman who are older than me, 55, 56, 57, and then somebody will tell you if they're 57, they're pretty much in the evening part of their lives. I'm trying to figure out, I'm just trying to figure out to buy my first parcel of land. And if you, if you delve deep into their stories, some of them, one of the main reasons might be they've spent years dealing with immigration, palaver and all that. And then also coupled with family pressure. Now, it's totally different from 
Maybe you left children back home and you travel to the diaspora, you have children and a wife and you have to pay children school fees and all that. That's normal. You've got to take care of family and stuff. But of what use is it that you are trapped in this system or you are stuck in this system, you are catering for people and you leave yourself hanging? You know, I looked at the gentleman. If you asked me that if I could make one wish in the instant whilst we were having that conversation, if there was one thing I could ask the universe for whilst I was standing in front of that 69-year-old man who has bad hips, bad spinal cord due to repeated operations, he's got arthritis now, can't even hold spoons and cut things anymore. It's terrible, man. He's got diabetes on top. If there was one wish, I would ask that the universe turn, turn back the hands of time for that man. So he could hopefully have a second shot at life. But you and I know that it's impossible. We only get one shot at life and this is it. This is it. You get one shot. One shot at life. This is it. This is the shot. If you don't make it, if you do, if you make ghastly decisions that consume your life, if you make wise decisions that propel your life, if you pick the wrong partner, if you pick an amazing partner, if you fall into the hands of the law in terms of um, due to negative choices, we get one shot at life. This is it. So imagine being governed by sentiment. Imagine throwing your life into the hands of vindictive people, selfish, don't give a toss people. The worst part, and I've said it severally, I believe I'm talking to adults here. The worst part, uh, the worst impact emanates from parents. Because, and understandably so, they birth you. They give birth to you. They were the channels. The channel that you came, that brought you into existence, particularly your mom, right? So, you see, I keep saying understandably so, but they are usually the ones at the center point of emotional blackmail trying to peg your life, draining you financially, conniving to use you to lift up your siblings. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the worst thing that happens, that has happened to a lot of people. I cannot count the number of people that recognize me on the pavement. Frankly, maybe it's, uh, some of them might be older, might be my age band, might be younger than me when you start talking. It's the parents. The parents are at the core center of this problem. I'm not asking you to pull out daggers and go after them. Hmm. You gotta learn to say no. You have to be brutal. You have to be firm. We have one shot at life. If you have a 69 year old father, a 70 year old mom, or 70 plus year old. Yeah, you love them, or 80s, or whatever. That's, that's absolutely fine. But they've lived their life. Don't forget. They've lived. This is your shot at life. So you, what's the essence of doing yourself a major disservice by being blindly wrapped in this foolishness. If you have a 69 year old, 70, they've lived to a point. If they drop dead today, I know you're gonna miss them. Um, you love them, I get that. But if they're going into the burial ground, you're not going to fall in there with them. However much you cry, they're gone. Even if you die before them, they wouldn't 
they wouldn't fall into the pit with you. I'm just telling you, man. And I know, because years of mental conditioning, this, this thing is um, it's a major problem in Africa, man. It's a major, major problem. It's a major problem. I know people, they understand what I'm talking about. They agree with me 100%. Do you know what their problem is? Implementation of what they hear me talk about. I've heard people say that to me via email and in person. They say, Franklin, you are bang on the money. Bullseye. Your point, your submissions make sense. He said, bruv, I can't. I, I just can't look at my mom. I can't. <laughs> You're mentally trapped. I get it. You don't have to go guns blazing. I'm not here asking you to pull out a dagger. Come on, man. They say something in Yoruba. What do you see on Oligba? You just say no. How is that going to kill you? Okay, I'll give you an example. I'm talking hypothetically. I have a parent that's trying to manipulate me, asking me for 300,000 naira for some bogus, what I deem to be a bogus demand, right? Forget the fact that maybe I have the 300,000 naira or not. If I am not going to give that money, I am not going to give that money. If I read between the lines, depending on what the demand is and whatnot, I may say, all right, okay, depending on what it is, if I feel compelled, right, in this circumstance, I've only got 80,000 naira to give you. And that's that. I'm not telling you that I'll balance it next month. That's what I've got to give you. Hey, me, 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 go see. Hey, me, 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 It's a lie. The psychological games will start because they have a target. They want you to part with that money. I hear people say to me, my family don't even ask me questions about, oh, what do I, what do you do abroad? What do you do for a living? How do you, uh, how do you, how do you make money? So some of you, you know what I'm saying, you are diasporans. Some of you would send me emails and say, Franklin, I've got two jobs. I live in Texas, I've got three jobs. He said, I've lived abroad for 14 years. So Franklin, guess what? My mom and dad have never asked me what I do for a living, how I even survive in the USA. They don't care. You know why? You are in America. That's good enough. Bring the Forex. Just bring the Forex. Bring the damn thing on a monthly basis. Who cares? If you do nine jobs for a living, who cares if you work 18 hours a day? Just bring the damn Forex, man. Come on, man. Do you understand me? Just bring the Forex. If you live in England, they don't care if you face racism. They don't care if, as we speak, you are thinking of how to balance your mortgage payments for this month. They don't care if you are cracking your head right now, knowing that your, your children need, you've got three children, you're figuring out like they need new sets of uniform, they need to update their wardrobe, they need new trainers. One of them is asking you for a new iPad. You and your wife are cracking your heads. The rent is due, the credit card bills, the mortgage, the car finance, the lease goes on. They don't care. Franklin is in England. They need the sterling on a monthly basis. They don't care. Do you understand me? They do not care. So when, when, when you are repeatedly throwing analyses about your finance at people that don't care, it's like you're throwing water at a rock. The mind is already set in stone. So if you don't play ball, the next thing that they've got to offer you is just resentment, connivance. And the thing is, this is what I said in the previous live stream, 
they are constantly plotting and scheming. If they try you last month, hi, Shane Walegbe, they try you last month, they couldn't get through, they give you a month breathing space. They are coming back with another format in the month of November. Towards the end of November, or in the first week of December, they are already rubbing their palms, waiting for Christmas package. They're, they're waiting. They're waiting. There's some of you right now, do, do you get what I'm saying? For the most part, people that live in diaspora, except, you know, you make a fuss because for those that celebrate Christmas, I don't. I don't anymore. I did that in years past. You know, it's just a holiday season for me now. So, but if you've got children, you know, it's um, holiday season, buy them gifts and all that. But apart from that, back home, they want to have a fancy Christmas celebration. They're expecting the lump sum. So that's the story, man. I hope you do. I sent $100 to help my cousin. The next month, she calling me saying she want a phone. I blocked her. <laughs> Ophelia, man. They were emotionally blackmailing me, telling me, telling me, telling you they would die if you don't send money. Yeah. It's emotional blackmail. It's the survival for the fetest. When I say fetest, I'm talking mentally now. This is what I said earlier. I have so many people that will send me emails. Franklin, everything you say is spot on, man. Bro, you're the best. But a lot of you don't even know how to implement it because that's why. Listen, man. It's the same thing. You're a grown man, you're in your 40s. Your mom is asking you questions about your marriage, about your wife, and then you're not willing to answer her questions in that regard because that's private to you. And you're telling her mom, don't, don't know why. And then your mom is telling her, are you stupid? Yeah, so, 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 sorry, ma. Sorry, ma, for what? Are you dumb? At your age? That's not you being disrespectful. You have to G-check that woman. If she doesn't want to recognize barriers, you set the barriers yourself. You understand? Why is she interested in knowing your business with your woman? One leg in, the other leg will follow. They will run your marriage for you. They will destroy your life. So that's not being rude. So I'm the type of dude. So for example, you're asking me about my, my woman and I'm looking at you with a poker face. So, um, um, these, uh, so your wife, uh, blah, 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 blah. So when I'm not responding, the silence is actually telling you to mind your damn business. So if I have a parent, if I have a parent who then takes that personally and they think that me ignoring them is being rude and they try to, uh, I, will, um, I will respond to them. I'm a grown man. I'm a grown ass man. There comes a point in a man's life you have to put your foot down. But you see, in the African environment, they condition you, even when you're in your 70s, and you're, let's say you're 70 and your mother is 95. If you Imagine, you are already a grandpa at 70. You have brittle bones now. So if you say, mommy, stop, and mommy, no. It's, ah, oh, no, you can't talk like that. That is how they chain you down. That's exactly how they control your life. Do you get it now? You have to break away from it. It's all mental game. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's the one. They call you westernized. Of course. Because, you see, the moment you're a non-conformist, there's a, there's a, come on, man, there are sensible people on this live stream. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference between being firm and assertive and being absolutely obnoxious. Do you see? Do you get what I'm saying? So... I had an elder in the family recently. There was somebody, like a friend of the family, and um, the person's extended family member died. You know, like in Yoruba land, you have to keep uh, greet somebody, I oh, quarrel in you and stuff. But the thing is, that person's extended family member that died, I don't even know them. 
I don't know them. I'm not, you, do, do you know what I'm saying? So I had an elderly person in my family here in the UK then called me and said, ah, uh, Tokumbo, um, won't you show me, uh, pick the phone to greet uh, this, this, this. I cut them off faster than the speed of light. I said, no, I don't know that person. I'm, you know, that's like way too much, way too deep into their family tree. I, I don't, I'm not interested. The death has absolutely nothing to do with me. And they were like, I see. And I just walked off. Me That doesn't make you rude. That doesn't mean, oh, 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 I'm not sure if you want to. It's a lie. man. I haven't got time for that. They know me. I, me man, sorrow, Tony. This is how I feel about something. My no is no in giant caps lock. I stand my ground and I stand by my words. No, this is how I see it. I'm not doing this. Do you understand me? There are loads of families and tying it to what I was talking about earlier, there are loads of families where it, it's, a, it's a toxic culture. It's spread across a lot of African families. There's a practice where you have all, all these uncles, aunties, grandmas and people you know, meddling because they look at everybody's age band. They, 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 I think they catch a buzz from, they want to peg down your life. They want to be able to put their mouth into your personal affairs. In African families, there is absolute disregard for boundaries. So even though your uncle is in his sixties, right? You're like, you're like 40 or your late thirties or your early forties and stuff. He, he wants to basically tell you where the wind blow from. Like, I'm a grown man. You, you, you dig. Even there are certain things that happen in the family. You realize that, oh, hang on. They didn't even bother to tell me. They, they, you know, they, it's just all this nonsensical red taping. Or when you sit down to express yourself about certain things, they want you to know that, no, 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 no. We don't, even though you're making sense 100%, they, they don't want you to, they, they, they feel that, no, 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 no. We are older than you. We should be the only person to be able to express ourselves. Me, I go toe to toe with any elder within the family tree. It's not disrespect. I'm a grown man. Because you're 60, you can say something and I can't. Why? Do you understand? It's not rudeness. That's why the way I also live my life is my wife cannot be called by anybody, anyhow. Did you hear what I said? She's a lovely woman, but she can't be called by anybody on some stupid errand. I, er I eradicated that from way back. So they don't even have the balls of steel. Some of them watch my channel quietly. I hope they're watching tonight. One more me. Oh, give me son You know what I mean? I don't encroach. I don't jump into people's lanes. If you come into my lane, it's going to be like World War Three. I'll be like a three-headed dragon. Stay over there, though. I hate people when they don't respect boundaries. I don't do that nonsense where my woman becomes somebody's errand girl and they start saying nonsense, some old uncle's wife. Uh, yeah, okay, kiri bossy be love, law, bossy be a fumi wala moon, nine long, cool, so. Yo, there's a difference between your woman taking initiative. You know, you see an older auntie and, oh, hi, auntie, would you like a plate of food? Or, oh, let me carry your bag. Those normal stuff. Come on, man. We get that. But don't say, ah, you. Come here. Uh, yeah, is that your wife? Uh, talking about. Uh, yeah, wah, wah, wah. Come and carry that broom. Go and wash that toilet for me. Ah, yes, ma. Okay. What? If you don't get your black behind in your toilet, go and wash your toilet. What for toilet, Funtani? Do you understand? Ah, what about me? Be a tiny girl in your freezer. What else your bear? Can you hear for me? Log bay lion, what? Log bay, can you? Eh, where from? Eh? Ah, you know, feet. You can't do that with me. Nah. There's no chance. Kill your missy. 
If you got shot, go to me. You're in Obruku. You can't. You can't do that. They know not to. They can't try me. Even my parent can't try me. I'm telling you. Is, do you think because I despise my parents? No. I set the boundaries, man. That's another. I'm going into another topic completely. That right there is the reason why a lot of brothers have unnecessary relationship-related problems. You are too busy pleasing your mom. You want to turn your, your wife into some kind of puppets in your mom's hand to please your mom. Don't do that. When people respect boundaries, you know, your wife would... Things will flow organically. Your wife would naturally gravitate towards your mom. Ah, oh, mommy, we look after your mom and, you know, there will be love and mutual respect. Not this, because your woman mommy, finger snapping. One be by, look, kakpa ta mi fumi to wa ni no keni ya ti bra mi ye, ko mu wasi. Kakpa ta ki gilo ve fa u bo ye. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So, I hope we... <laughs> And uh, newly developed BP, I nearly developed BP from trying to help family until I cut them. Families, man, look, man, they're like mammite, right? But I'm, I'm of the opinion, and you should know me already, man. Look, you carve your own path. You have the ability to. If you want to be bish bash bosh about it, then of course, you deal with the devastating outcome. You have to learn to stand firm. Say no. The same thing with finance. These old man stories that are brought tonight, there are too many. Look, if I open my inbox, there are a gazillion of stories, man. And a lot of them look so similar. That's why I cannot come here and do the same story repetitively. Even though they are unique to each individual, a lot of them are so similar. And it breaks my heart, man. How can you tell me you're a 45-year-old man? You have a wife in England with three children. Your mom is calling you from Nigeria. Lekon, T300 pounds here, but dear, what me before Friday? A pelo magba. Mommy, I should judge an issue. If if I don't collect that 300 pounds before Friday, I will curse you. If I like a mommy team, be no. So I'm going to send away a single. You're a 45 year old man. My man, fear me. Deru bye. Ah, who is the buru now? Who took my buru? Come on, man. Your wife is on the sidelines trying to let you realize that you're a grown man. Not much. But let your mom know that you're a married man. No, you, you can't, don't get him. You don't understand. You can't tell me how to interact with my mom. Mm. Uh. <laughs> Mama, I don't want to cry. The worst is when the blackmail you with sickness and hospital bills. Uh, that's it. That one is. Uh, the family gone gone in Yahoo. That's it. The daily, monthly format. I'm telling you, man. Some of you guys with your big chest, you can't look at your mom in the face and set boundaries, man. You have a long way to go. That's why you have issues. Then you maliciously start blaming your wife. Oh, go, go, what? Your mom see me. There is one that irritates me. Let me say this and I, and I, I drop the shutters on this show, man. Uh, you, you you giving your your wife some kind of a mandate? If you don't, you, you I know that my mom has issues, but you need to go and sort out with my mom, or else there's not going to be smooth sailing. You're crazy. I hope another man finds that your woman. You're crazy. You are really crazy. You are setting parameters for your wife, giving her deadline to go and sort with your mom, or else he Ah. I hope another man finds that woman and pounds her to dust. Because you're not. It makes no sense. That's your mum. So you set the boundaries. You man up and set the goddamn boundaries. That's not your mum's relationship. The last time, that was a wedding here. I don't remember joining you and your mum. Come on, man. I, I love my mum. Oh, I love my mom. 
I get that. You love your mum, right? Mother's love over there. Compartmentalize the love. Your wife over here. Ayeya Otto. Some of you, you're playing God back home. You're depriving your children. You can't even take your wife to the top of the shard in London, go enjoy a weekend together. Nice meal. Come on, London Eye. Oh, what do you want you? Lola in London Eye. Omo di lo shefun. Oniro. Oniro. Omo di ata balag balongu London Eye. There's no need. Oh, London Eye was designed for children. There's no need. What are you doing? There's no need. The children don't need it. Go and buy them KFC. Oh, le rong jessile. Idris. Once you go back, yeah, let's go now. Come on, man. Some of you, yeah, and it's the same thing, vice versa, some women as well. Do you know what I mean? You can't join hands with your partner or even support money truly because all of your money goes, you're playing God in Africa, man. It's all mental conditioning. That's me done. Thank you for listening to my story. Um, I appreciate you, man. Hit the like button. Uh, uh, come on, man. There's uh, 255 people. Hit the like button. Hit the like button. If you haven't, give consideration to smashing the subscribe button button thank you for listening to me please smash the like button man thank you boy below my brother i love you man thank you uh hit the like button hit the like button thank you hit the like button come on people let's get it to 300 plus likes at least for now man uh if you haven't follow me on instagram at franklin exactly the way it's spelt on my on my channel. If you want to support my channel monetarily via pay, uh, PayPal, people ask me all the time. That's why I'm saying it. It's in the description of this video. You find a link to my PayPal uh, cash app, the pound Stalin sign, 1302 Frank. Uh, you send me an email, footchannel1960 at gmail.com. You can send me your stories if you have questions. If you want the Adron Homes and uh, Properties uh, Application Pack, send me an email and I'll send it to you. Thank you for listening. And I'll most definitely, most definitely catch you in the very next one. Peace and love. Franklin, what about podcast? I'm bringing it back, okay? I'll bring it back. I promise. Thank you. Bye-bye now.